All right, do you see my desktop? That's right. Okay, I'll go ahead and start the presentation here. All right, so that start screen shows up on everybody's screen? Looks good. Okay, great. So welcome to the Cascadia Alaska webinar. Uh, this is, the, as Andy uh, uh, described, this is the first of four webinars that are discussing potential target sites for Subduction Zone Observatory. And these webinars will help to start this discussion ahead of the workshop next week in Idaho. My name is David Schmidt. I'm from the University of Washington, and I'm co-convening the webinar with uh, Donna Shingleton from Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory and Michelle Coombs from the USGS in Anchorage. Uh, so on the screen, you should see today's outline for today's webinar. Uh, I'll provide a brief overview of the Cascadia subduction system and highlight potential scientific questions that could be addressed in Cascadia. This will be followed by short perspectives from Paul Wells and Doug Tui from the University of Oregon, who will expand on uh, questions that they find most compelling. And then we'll move on to the Alaska Aleutian Subduction System, and Donna and Michelle will provide an overview. This will again be followed by perspectives from Diana Roman from the Carnegie Institution and Rob Witter from the USGS in Anchorage. And then following the highlights from Cascade, Alaska, we will then open it up for discussion, hopefully in the final 20 minutes. And we encourage the audience to submit questions, comments, ideas, suggestions, which you can do by typing in, as Andy described. Uh, and to streamline the discussion, Andy will collect and organize those uh, at the end. So let's start with the goals for the webinar. Um, so our objective for today is really to identify the most compelling scientific opportunities, uh, questions for our subduction zone observatory in Cascadia and Alaska. And we hope to also identify what capabilities, data sets, infrastructure would be needed to answer these questions and what existing data infrastructure could be leveraged. And finally, we want to identify who might be important partners in Cascade and Alaska, particularly international partners, and how might these collaborations work. So our time is short today, so obviously we will not be able to cover all possible topics, and we'll need to go through the material fairly quickly. Um, but we are interested in collecting your ideas and suggestions, particularly topics that are not represented in the presentations, and a summary of this webinar will be presented at the Seduction Zone Observatory Workshop, and we want to try to uh, represent the broad interests of the community. Okay, so please uh, pass along any feedback you might have. So let's start off with a quick overview of the Cascadia Subduction Zone. So we have the Juan de Fuca Plate subducting beneath North America, and that convergence occurs about three to four centimeters per year. Convergence is trench normal into the north, and it's uh, slightly oblique to the south. There are also two smaller plates to the north and south end of the Juan de Fuca, the Explorer and the Gorda plates. Most of the seismicity uh, in the Cascadia system is around the Mendocino Triple Junction to the south and also in the Puget Sound area. And the central part of the system is pretty quiet, unusually quiet uh, for most subduction systems. The volcanic arc includes 12 high threat volcanoes, which are indicated by the red triangles on the graphic. And in terms of the risk to the population, most of the population lives along the I-5 corridor, which includes Portland, Tacoma, Seattle, and Vancouver. Uh, if we think about tsunami, the risk from tsunamis, again, most of the population lives on the coast in northwest Oregon and southwest Washington. OK, so that's a quick overview of the Cascadia system. Um, there are a number of uh, resources that already exist in Cascadia and experiments that are taking place or have taken place in the past, and these could be leveraged for our subduction observatory in the future. So if I'll first focus on what are, what are the, uh, the infrastructure that already exists. Of course, we have both seismic and geodetic networks that reside within the Northwest, maintained by the Pacific Northwest Seismic Network and Penga. And Earthscope has also invested quite a bit in Cascadia, both with the Plate Boundary Observatory and also with USRA, which included both seismic, magnetotelluric, and atmospheric instrumentation onshore. There are also some assets offshore in the form of cabled arrays, and that includes the regional scale nodes, uh, which goes off from Pacific City there on the graphic in the center. And we also have the Neptune array up to the north off of Vancouver Island. So those are kind of the, 
built-in infrastructure that exists in our region. Uh, we also have lots of past experiments that have been run that have collected data which could be utilized. And those include Cascade Initiative, which included both seismic and uh, absolute pressure gauges that were offshore. Those kind of locations are indicated in the center figure of your screen. There are also offshore experiments from the uh, Suzanne Carbutz experiment for the Juan de Fuca Ridge to Trench seismic experiment. Onshore, there's a, a number of experiments that are ongoing or have occurred in the past, including IMUSH, looking at Mount St. Helens, the MOCA experiment, the Array of Arrays that looked at tremor events, the CAFE experiment, which include both seismic and MT instrumentation, the Mendocino experiment, uh, and probably other seismic and MT experiments that I don't know about might be added to this list. There are also uh, several seafloor geodesy experiments that are currently taking place. I know of three which are uh, exploiting different instrumentation including uh, GPS acoustic uh, observations offshore Oregon using uh, gliders. There's also a current experiment using uh, uh, pressure gauges that can be calibrated and finally there are borehole instruments that are being placed in the north. So those are the kind of ongoing projects that are happening now and can be utilized. So next I wanted to move on to what are the really interesting science questions and new opportunities that could be addressed in Cascadia. Uh, so a lot of research has gone into studying the, the spectrum of fault behavior that occurs in Cascadia and this will be a recurring theme pretty much in all subduction zones uh, that, that are discussed in all these webinars. So the big questions are where, what is the extent and where is locking occurring offshore and what are the implications for the seismic hazard. We're also interested in uh, slow slip and churn, which has been a major focus in Cascadia. I could make several slides talking about interesting questions. I will just highlight uh, maybe the future looking questions, which is this issue of whether there are slow slip events occurring in the shallow portion near the trench in Cascadia. We really have no observations yet to tell us of that, yet we see in other subduction zones. And if there are shallow slow slip events in Cascadia, how might these interact with uh, seismic activity that might be happening? Uh, in the lock zone. There's been a lot of work looking at the geologic structure and history of Cascadia. Um, within the forearc we have Silicia, uh, which is a large mafic block uh, that has a long history and there's been a lot of study in trying to map out and understand where Silicia originated from. Um, as uh, time has evolved, Silicia and that fork is slowly migrating, swinging out and migrating to the north as seen in the center plot with the modern day GPS data. Uh, that leads to a lot of questions about really how strain is accommodated within the fork, arc, uh, particularly to the north as this fork arc is slamming into a stable British Columbia and, and, um, and you you result in a lot of faults that occur within the Seattle Basin and the Yakima Fold and Thrust Belt. There's also interesting questions about the significance of various back arc structures, including the owl, various liniments uh, that are occurring in the back arc. When we think of subduction systems, we think of that they're the primary delivery of uh, oceanic crust, sediments, and fluids down into the mantle. And of course, that results into melts being generated, which produces our volcanoes. Uh, and so there are a whole set of questions one could ask uh, about where these melts are taking place and how they're migrating up through the crust, um, looking at various melt processes. In addition to what melts are being uh, contained within the rocks that go into serpentinization of that mantle wedge and the extent of that, uh, of that serpentinization. When we look at a lot of properties in Cascadia, we see that there are systematic variations and lots of different observables. And I kind of have a list here of the things that come to my mind. You see different rupture segmentation along strike based on the turbidity record uh, and different recurrence levels at different latitudes. The ETS recurrence varies systematically along strike. There are also systematic variations in the geochemistry of the arc lavas. The distribution of seismicity is very characteristic with really just on the ends of the subduction system. You even see a long stripe variations in structures within the prism 
including the vergence of the frontal thrust, and, and finally, even the topography has a very systematic pattern of long strikes. So there are all these observables in Cascadia, and I think a, a, an overarching question is really what are the properties or parameters that control this systematic pattern and heterogeneity and behavior uh, a long strike. We don't really have a good sense of how all these things are connected to one another uh, and what parameters are really important for that. Um, another important question has to do with the fate and state of the downgoing slab. That slab is becoming hydrated as it approaches the trench uh, and the hydration state of the slab then sets up all the other um, events as that slab is subducted. Uh, once the slab is subducted, there are questions about what happens to the slab, whether it's continuous with depth or whether it falls apart, as revealed in some of the recent tomography images. Uh, and then there are questions about how that subducting slab interacts with the mantle around it. Uh, there's a whole list of other questions which we don't have time to get to. I've just listed a couple of them here, things looking at what's happening in the prism with gas hydrates and fluid fluxes, exploiting that offshore turbidite record to look at rupture history, interactions with the Yellowstone plume with the subducting slab, uh, the extent of ponded magmas at depth. So there's a, a long list of, of questions that we don't have time for, but are also important to kind of point out. Uh, so. My last slide here is really just to touch on what are potential partnerships. There are a lot of existing international partnerships between Canada and the U.S. in Cascadia, which would set a strong foundation. Uh, there's these offshore arrays, which there's collaboration going on. There's earthquake early warning, and there's a sharing of data for just seismic monitoring that are all currently happening. Um, in terms of other collaborations, international collaborations within the slow slip insurance community, I think there are opportunities for international collaborations of sharing data and processing data in different ways. Uh, and finally, there are some inherent partners we have in all this work, including the USGS, NOAA, uh, and members of the oceanic oceanographic community. Okay, so at this point, I'm going to pass it off to Paul Wells and Doug Toomey who are going to provide their own perspectives or what, of what are some important questions uh, in Cascadia. So we'll start with Paul at this point. All right, Paul, I'm going to uh, move the prompt right over to you, so you should be able to share your screen whenever you like. Okay. Uh, we're going to show the slides from David's screen. Oh, so even better. Right now. Got it. Yeah, so we're all... Okay, hello, everybody. This is Paul Wallace from University of Oregon. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. So uh, I just wanted to uh, build on a few of the things that uh, David talked about that I think are really exciting uh, science opportunities and, and important and interesting questions that can be addressed in Cascadia. Um, as David mentioned, subduction zones are the primary site on Earth where uh, oceanic crust and uh, volatiles uh, contained in altered crust are returned back into the mantle. Uh, one of the really important things about Cascadia is that it's a global end member in terms of the uh, how young the subductive plate is when it enters the trench, and therefore that it's relatively hot. Uh, and this is illustrated in the diagram on the bottom of the slide here. This is from Ellen Syracuse's work uh, showing uh, the thermal parameter, uh, which is defined on the right side of the slide there. It's the product of the uh, velocity of the incoming plate, uh, the age of the trench, and the, and the design of the dip angle. And it's a measure, really, of how uh, hot the plate should be when it enters. And on the horizontal axis uh, is a result of the geodynamic modeling uh, that Alan and her colleagues did, uh, where they predict slab surface temperatures. And what you can see, really, is the cascades along with Mexico plotting down in the lower right of the diagram is really at the, the end of the global spectrum in terms of relatively hot oceanic crust. And this is really important because uh, it causes shallow and early dehydration uh, of the hydrous minerals in the oceanic crust, and it really uh, tests some of, allows us to test some of our uh, most important ideas about arc magmatism. Uh, basically, since the advent of plate tectonics, the basic paradigm for arc magma generation has been recycling of fluids from the plate into the mantle wedge. And if you have early and shallow dehydration, then you um, quite likely have a reduced fluid flux into the mantle. Uh, and so it allows us to test some ideas about the importance of mantle flow uh, within the wedge, 
uh, upwelling and decompression melting and how these affect melting uh, independent of uh, inputs that might be coming from the subductive plate. Uh, next slide, David. Can you go to the next slide, David? Okay, so to illustrate this, uh, on the left is a map from the recent uh, paper by Emily Mullen and Dominique Weiss showing both the uh, high cascades uh, labeled HC and the volcanoes to the north of that in the Garibaldi volcanic field uh, and then the offshore uh, plate geometry. Um, and so I want to use this just to highlight uh, the, along, the important along arc variations that we find in the geochemistry of lavas within the Cascades and how we can really use this to try to separately understand the role of uh, fluid recycling versus mantle dynamics uh, in magma generation. So it's been recognized for a long time that there are important along arc uh, geochemical variations and these for the high Cascades are summarized in the lower right a uh, graph from the work of Marie Schmidt uh, in 2008. And the important thing on this graph is that the vertical axis, the barium to cerium ratio, is a good ge geochemical indicator in basaltic magmas of fluid addition uh, from the subducted plate. And so the regions that are labeled central and south, those come from the volcanoes in uh, about the southern half of what's labeled HC for high cascades. And you can see that that region, which includes the Mount Lassen and Mount Shasta areas, has a uh, relatively high uh, addition of fluid, uh, fluids coming from the subducted plate compared to what's labeled North and Columbia segment, which are the volcanoes starting at about Mount Jefferson and the Oregon Cascades and extending up to the Canadian border. So there seems to be a, a very large difference in the amount of fluid flux recycled uh, from the plate here uh, in the different regions. And it's important to try to uh, understand how this might be related. These differences might be related to differences in the hydration state of the incoming plate or to other processes that are happening within the mantle wedge. So you can contrast that, the area to the north, the Garibaldi volcanic belt. Um, uh, in that region, the, the, from trace elements and isotopes, the input of recycled material is relatively muted. And uh, what uh, Mullen and White showed in 2015 is that there are systematic along arc uh, variations that lead to the model shown in the upper right, where they suggest that there is a trench parallel flow uh, of hot mantle coming from uh, underneath the Northeast Pacific region, and that the interaction of this with a uh, hydrated and depleted mantle wedge uh, sets the stage for melting processes and the, the differences that you see along arc. So uh, if you could go to the next slide, please, David. So again, there, there are these very important along arc differences in geochemistry that we can use in conjunction with geophysical uh, methods to try to uh, uh, understand this arc system. So I think really in Cascadia, some of the major questions uh, involved, as David highlighted, uh, kind of the pathways and processes by which fluids are recycled uh, from the slab uh, into the melt generation zone and the wedge. And a really important uh, question in Cascadia is uh, how much water uh, is being subducted in the form of hydrated or serpentinized mantle in the downgoing plate, and where does that break down and release its water? Um, we need to look at the relationship, as I mentioned, between the long arc geochemical variations and how that might relate to hydration state, but also to other uh, tectonic uh, features in the arc. And then uh, finally, uh, there's an important question about what controls the locations of major long-lived volcanoes, and in particular, uh, whether their locations are set by processes that operate in the mantle and focus how melts uh, are, are sent into the crust or whether they reflect crustal focus and processes. And I think really the way forward with this uh, is the final point here is a need to integrate uh, geophysical imaging of the lower crust and mantle like what's been done in the, uh, the very successful IMUSH project uh, with a diagram showing the lower left there of how P wave velocities and VPVS ratios can be used to image areas where magma is stored, labeled uh, F1 and F4 there under Mount St. Helens in Indian Heaven, and, and potentially areas where dense cumulates form in the lower crust, labeled H1 and H2. Uh, and this really needs to be uh, uh, integrated together with geophysical data um, uh, for flow within the mantle. Uh, and then integrated in with geochemical data sets, both for the regional basaltic lavas that we think give us a better picture of what's happening within the mantle, but also to test the idea as to whether these regional basalts really are the type of magma that is feeding and supplying the large long-lived volcanoes. And then finally, uh, similar high-resolution imaging to what's been done in the IMOSH 
project uh, could be useful uh, to study what's happening at mantle levels. And I just show the example in the lower right uh, where P wave velocities suggest under northeast Japan suggest that there are hot fingers rising up under discrete areas uh, of more abundant volcanic activity, suggesting that processes within the mantle are really dictating variations in magma flux along the arc. Okay, so I will go ahead and stop there and turn it over to Doug Toomey. All right, Doug, I'm going to give you uh, screen sharing. <clears throat> okay, so hopefully you see that. Uh, this is Doug Toomey from the University of Oregon, and in the small amount of time I have, I'd like to try and describe some of the things I find particularly exciting to look at and cascading in the future. And one of those is simply, you know, to what extent has sub subduction stopped in southern and northern Cascadia? Uh, I think the Cascadia subduction zone provides an opportunity to investigate how the edges of a subduction zone interact with the mantle. And they provide critical tests of genodynamic models, including whether or not slab rollback exists. That was predicted from onshore data and offshore data from Cascadia says not so much in southern Gorda, so there's something happening differently in southern Cascadia besides slab rollback. The edges of these systems provide a test of geodynamic models for mantle viscosity, which I think is a wild card in these systems, and pretty much anywhere where you have lithosphere sphenosphere coupling. And also the deformation that's occurring in southern Gorda and the northern explorer that suggests the reorganization of the plate boundaries provides an opportunity for looking at lithospheric dynamics and failure uh, criteria. Uh, these results also have significant implications for seismic hazards. If Explorer and Gord are actually being abandoned from subduction, it could, in fact, increase seismic hazards by moving from the infrequent large events to uh, more frequent, smaller magnitude earthquakes that be, could be occurring in those areas. The next question, oops, skipped one. The next question is, what is the magma plumbing system beneath arc volcanoes from the mantle to the upper crust? This is really a very difficult problem, and in the mantle it's been done, I would say, uh, only to first order and not that well. Uh, we need methods that actually quantitatively incorporate seismic anisotropy and geodynamic predictions. Uh, the results in a writer from a recent paper by Max Bazada and others, and it shows a geodynamic model that was used to calculate the isotropic and anisotropic seismic signals of subduction. And the first uh, tomographic image shows if you just invert the isotropic delays alone, you can recover the slab structure quite well. But if you ignore the effects of anisotropy, then there are artifacts around the slab, the low velocity zones you see in the no anisotropy image, that look you know, remarkably similar to melt production in the back arc areas. And so uh, I think one view of subduction zone images is we've done a very good job of perhaps imaging high velocity features that are going downwards but I think people should be very suspect of the low velocity features because most images, practically all of them, have been isotropic and thus have significant artifacts. Uh, in the crustal areas onshore, we need to be able to collect data that gets us beyond low resolution travel time tomography models, and I think this really is a technological problem that can be solved in the next decade or two, which is whether or not we can actually have experiments similar to the one conducted on Santorini recently where there were on the order of 160 seismometers and 15,000 sources. In the case of land studies, whether they're in Cascadia or other subduction zones, imaging arc volcanoes onshore is going to require a larger number of sensors than we've had access to previously. And when we can do that, we can use more sophisticated methods, such as full waveform inversion and other techniques to get higher resolutions images than we've had thus far. I think one question that's pretty exciting for uh, the Cascadia region is whether or not the offshore subduction zone is segmented. We saw from both David and Paul's presentation that there's a long arc variations in structures, and we have very little information on the detailed uh, structure of the thrust zone offshore. Uh, the Cascadia initiative really only provides baseline information on larger scale structures, and they're sort of limited in resolution. So a lot of the imaging is using teleseismic surface waves or body waves or ambient noise and that's not capable of uh, imaging the thrust interface in higher resolution. There are existing active source data. There's a nice paper out by Horning et al. recently from the Ridge to Trench experiment 
but the coverage for active source data is limited. There's also some work done in Central Oregon uh, by Chris Kenyon and Ann Trehu at OSU taking a look at detailed 3D structure. I think in the future, one of the things we really need for Cascadia is systematic mapping of the thrust interface and incoming structures. Uh, this is probably going to have to be a community experiment on the scale of what the Japanese have done along their subduction zone and a series of 2D and 3D experiments so we can see what the incoming structure of the uh, oceanic plate is and what the detailed physical properties are in the subduction zone itself. Lastly, I'd like to go to a smaller scale, but one that's critically important for the Cascadia region is the relationship between earthquakes and landslides. Uh, the map on the right is from Josh Roy's work for the Oregon Cascades, and the red areas show that literally thousands of uh, deep-seated landslides that exist throughout the coast range. And the blue lines show the major lifelines connecting the I-5 corridor to the coast. There's been lots of discussion of whether or not these deep-seated landslides are triggered by large earthquakes, a question that's still outstanding. And what we'd like to know, in addition to whether or not they are triggered by these large events, is what are the mechanics of failure? Uh, what role does the local geology or local topography uh, play in amplifying site response? And ultimately, can we better predict this hazard and mechanics of those, uh, those events? And I'll stop there. Thank you. OK, I'll swing it over to uh, Donna to start off on Alaska. All right, can you hear me and see my screen? Looks good. Great. All right, um, now I'm going to take us uh, north to the Alaska Aleutian subjection zone. Um, I'd like to start by you know, briefly giving an, an overview of this system for anyone who's not familiar. Uh, here, the Pacific plate is subducting beneath the North American plate at about 50 to uh, 70 millimeters per year. Uh, most of the incoming Pacific plate is is relatively old, so this is a much colder subduction zone than, uh, than Cascadia. Um, and this is a very seismically and volcanically active uh, system. Um, nearly the entire margin is ruptured in great earthquakes in the last century. The pink um, ovals here show the estimated extent of past great ruptures, um, including the 1964 earthquake, which was the second largest instrumentally recorded earthquake ever. Um, this is also a very volcanically active system. Uh, there's 52 active volcanoes along, along the Alaska Aleutian Trench, and, um, and they erupt frequently enough such that there's one to two eruptions per year. Um, another very important and interesting part of the system is that nearly every single aspect of the architecture and processes vary along the subduction zone. Um, you move from an uh, oceanic arc in the west to a uh, a continental arc um, in the east. Um, there are huge changes in the obliquity of subduction, um, the thickness and of sediment coming in, and hydration of the plate potentially. Uh, large changes in the uh, extent of past megathrust ruptures and the estimated extent of um, geodetically locked parts of the trench, the distribution of seismicity, the composition of volcanoes, and I could go on and on and on. But you know, very many things are, are changing along the subduction zone. Um, there have been a number of uh, studies here over the last um, the last years. Oh, this is very slowly advancing, or not? Let's see here. Oh no no no. Okay. Uh, so there have been a number of uh, recent studies along the um, Alaska Aleutian um, Trench that I'd like to uh, highlight. Um, one ongoing activity is the um, Earthscope Transportable Array is currently deploying in Alaska, and that's shown with the, uh, the red triangles um, on shore there. And if we zoom in, um, here's a map showing the year during which um, broadband seismic stations will be deployed in Alaska for, for this part of Earthscope. And what you can see is that by 2017, um, the deployment will be complete and it will provide excellent co seismic coverage um, onshore and including and some increased coverage uh, to the west along the Alaska Peninsula um, and including some of the, the islands off the Alaska Peninsula, but um, no extra coverage further west in the Aleutians um, or offshore. Um, there have also been a number of other uh, more focused studies. Um, onshore um, uh, past um, focused passive seismic uh, experiments included the moose and bear transects across the Kenai Peninsula and north shown with the the dark gray triangles. Um, there's currently the, the salmon um, 
seismic experiment deployed around Cook Inlet. Um, so these are providing more detailed views of seismicity and, uh, and subduction zone structure. Um, offshore, there have been a number of recent um, active source programs, um, including the um, STEEP program in 2009 all the way over to the, to the east, um, a couple of USGS programs um, offshore and, and then in the, the Bering Sea, and the uh, ALUT program. And so both the USGS and ALUT programs were in uh, 2011. Um, and uh, I've also shown on here a couple of, um, of, of older experiments from 94, the ASC 94 and the EDGE and, uh, and EDGE intact ones. Um, further west, there was recently a magnetotelluric and EM study on Okmok and, um, and sampling along of volcanoes uh, along, the, uh, along the Aleutian Trench. So I'll zoom in on that now. So here's a, a zoom in of the 2015 uh, MT seismic deployment. So you can see a very dense deployment around Okmok and as well as a transect across the arc. Um, the lower figure shows um, the locations of, um, of studies from you know, a combined set of experiment or a combined set of studies that happened um, in mostly in 2015. And so, um, through um, geoprisms in collaboration with uh, USGS and Deep Carbon Observatory for various parts of this project, uh, there was a common shared logistical platform that enabled people to go and uh, sample volcanoes along these distant reaches of the Aleutians as well as do um, some focused um, seismic deployments. And so I think uh, Diane Roman will tell us more about that. So there have been a number of um, acquisition efforts here, and there I'm sure there are many others that I haven't been able to cover um, in this presentation. But there's still very many questions and, um, and opportunities for further work. So I just want to quickly highlight um, a, a sampling of those. Um, as I mentioned, there have been great earthquakes along a lot of the subduction zone, um, and so there's a real opportunity to study what controls the extent and style of great earthquake rupture, and um, and how deformation uh, proceeds, um, you know, throughout the entire earthquake cycle. Um, along the plate boundary, there's changes in both megathrust earthquakes and in geodetic locking, and so you know, another big question is what are the you know, how, what controls the geodetic locking and how does that relate to, um, to great earthquake rupture? And so um, I think Rob Witter will, will touch on some of these questions next. Um, we know from um, some studies primarily in, on the Alaska part of the subduction zone that there are uh, slow slip events. Uh, the map here in the center, the circled, um, the dashed circles here show um, slow slip events and the, for reference, the purple line here outlines the 1964 uh, rupture zone. Um, but uh, we, we really know very little about where slow slip occurs in, in other parts of this subduction zone. Um, we also have the hint that there's a tremor along a lot of the subduction zone. The right panel shows the, the number of low frequency earthquakes happening in different sectors of the Alaska Aleutian Arc. And you can see that there are systematic variations along strike and the, the depth of estimated um, tremor occurrence. But the relationship between these slow slip events and trimmer to one another, or to great earthquake rupture and geodetic locking is still really poorly known in this in the system. Um, we also have um, kind of a smattering of imaging of the of the plate boundary from different seismic experiments at, at different um, scales. So the upper panel shows an example of a receiver function image from offshore from um, sorry from onshore Alaska, and the lower panel shows a seismic reflection image off the Alaska Peninsula. And you know these and, and other images that we have give us the hint of a long strike and down dip variations and the properties of the um, of the plate boundary. And so another important question is how these properties relate to changes in um, in behavior of the of the megathrust and slip behavior. I seem to be freezing here. Let's see. And I've obviously crammed too much science into this one <laughs> PowerPoint. Um, as I mentioned, um, the, there are a lot of a long strike variations in the composition of um, lavas that are coming out in the island arc. Um, so these upper two panels show a long strike variations in SiO2 and MgO of more primitive magmas. But you could plot a variety of other geochemical <laughs> uh, indicators here, and you would also see a long strike variations in those. And so we have a lot of questions about what controls the compositional diversity we see at the surface, and so how these magmas evolve from the slab, um, 
all the way on their transit up to the volcano and what consequences those have for the construction of the, um, of the art crust. So the lower image shows a um, receiver function study uh, at sort of widely spaced stations along the Aleutian arc, but we really don't know, um, you know what the level of variability is in crustal structure associated with these changes in geochemistry. And if you would have something like um, the profound variations that are observed in the, in the IBM system, for example. Gosh, I'm having some problems with these slides. I apologize. I'm almost done. Okay. Um, there are also a number of active volcanoes along the whole subduction zone, and I think uh, Diana Roman will tell us more about that. Um, but there are many of them, and they're very active. Um, and so on the lower left panel are a variety of geophysical um, uh, and um, surface geological um, observations of a, of a recent eruption of uh, Pavlov. And so the activity of all these volcanoes really provides an opportunity to observe um, the magma storage and magma eruption processes in, in, in detail. And finally, there, there also appear to be big variations in what's coming into the subduction zone in the uh, thickness of sediment on the incoming plate, as shown here on the left. Um, from some limited offshore active source data, we also have the hint that there could be variations in hydration of the crust and upper mantle. And so these inputs could have consequences for a variety of parts of the system, including megathrust properties and, um, and arc magnetism. And so there are many other opportunities that I didn't um, have a chance to list here, um, including uh, shallower landslide processes, uh, splay faults, and other structures in the overriding plate into the deeper geodynamics of the system. But um, hopefully this is a, gives you a sampling of some of the things that are out there. Um, there are many U.S. and state organizations and programs that are already really invested in Alaska and will be natural partners. So these include Geoprisms, Earthscope, uh, but also the USGS, Alaska Volcano Observatory, Alaska Earthquake Center, and others. And um, we'd be very keen to hear about more opportunities with uh, other international partners or U.S. partners from the participants. So. With that, I'll uh, finish up and, and hand it over to uh, Diana. All right, I'm going to uh, switch screen sharing over to you, Diana. Should uh, prompt should be coming up right now. Okay, there it is. So hopefully you guys are now seeing my screen and able to hear me. Andy can confirm that. Looks good. Sounds good Great. too. Okay. Um, and hopefully this isn't going to auto advance. Um, so my charge from Donna was to talk about what uh, I think the exciting opportunities and questions are in Alaska, and I'm going to um, address that from my perspective, which is volcanology. Um, there are a few things uh, that, to me, uh, really distinguish the Aleutian um, volcanoes um, as, as an arc. Um, one that's really key uh, is that they're relatively well characterized, um, both uh, because of the long-term efforts of the Alaska Volcano Observatory and the um, fairly mature uh, volcano monitoring networks that exist throughout the arc. Um, so you can see the map of Alaska there um, and the little tiny seismometers um, showing you the extent of, of seismic, continuous permanent seismic uh, monitoring stations. Um, which is uh, actually quite um, dense, um, given how difficult it is a, a place to work. Um, and so that's, that's really fantastic. Um, so we have a lot of seismic data uh, that tells us about what the volcanoes have, have been doing, extending back several decades now. We also have a lot of activity, as Donna mentioned. Um, this is a, an extremely volcanically active arc um, with a high rate of eruptive activity, um, on average one to two eruptions per year. Um, so there's a lot of data to build off of and a lot of understanding to build off of. And the other thing that I think uh, really distinguishes uh, this uh, arc is that the volcanic behavior is incredibly diverse. Um, there's a, a range from large um, explosive eruptions to small-scale dome building um, to phreatic activity um, to really everything in between. Almost every, every major type of subduction zone volcanism is, is represented um, by this arc. And there's also a very uh, diverse tectonic setting as well. Uh, Donna mentioned um, changes in the um, angle of convergence along the arc, um, moving from a continental to an oceanic um, 
overriding plate and so on. And so I think that this set of characteristics really um, combines to make a set of unique opportunities for, for volcanology um, and for building on the existing knowledge. Um, so I've, just as, as one example of this, people are, who are starting to mine this um, sort of suite of, of data um, is a couple of figures from a recent study by Helena Berman looking at on the top right um, the sort of density uh, distribution or the, the energy distribution of volcanic seismicity um, in depth along the entire arc um, and then comparing that to below that um, the uh, composition of the erupted magmas, the erupted lavas uh, again along the arc. Um, and this is really building on existing catalogs of, of samples and, and seismicity. And what this paper argues is that there's a, potentially a nice correlation between the depth of volcanic seismicity and um, the composition of the erupted magma. And then that, that suggests something about the depths of storage um, at different places in the arc. So these are the types of things that you can start to do. Um, uh, Donna mentioned, I don't unfortunately have a slide for it, but Donna mentioned a, a study that I'm uh, currently conducting in collaboration with Terry Plank, where we're looking at a suite of volcanoes in the Aleutian, in the Aleutians where there's a somewhat monotonic uh, change in the depth to the subducting slab from uh, the global minimum to the global maximum. And so we're using that suite of volcanoes and their eruptive products to help us understand how the depth to the slab uh, controls the water contents of the erupted magmas and the depths of storage of those magmas, so sort of along similar lines. Um, and this leads me to my point, which is I think that the major scientific opportunity in the Aleutians um, is starting to, to move beyond uh, developing understanding of individual volcanic systems and starting to move towards comparative volcanology and trying to extrapolate what we learn at an individual volca volcanic center to a more general model of subduction zone volcanism. Um, this is a major hurdle right now. It's a very difficult problem. It was elucidated very nicely in a recent paper uh, that I'm showing here by Kathy Cashman and Juliet Biggs, um, basically making the point that uh, there is a conundrum in volcanology uh, where we know that each individual volcanic center has a personality, um, a uniqueness. Uh, but there's a need, you can't study every individual volcano on Earth, so there's a need to somehow move beyond that personality and those details and try to uh, extrapolate to the common processes underlying all volcanoes on Earth or uh, subsets of volcanoes, classes of volcanoes on Earth. And so I think that the opportunity exists in the Aleutians, um, possibly more than any other arc on Earth, to really examine what, what contributes to a volcano's personality. So what are the major controls on a volcano's behavior? We have a general model of how subduction zone volcanism works, uh, but we see all this variation in, in reality. And so what are the parameters that are important in, in uh, creating that variation? Um, and so I think building on the, the historic data catalogs and, and understanding of the Aleutians, this is a place where it's possible to set up really nice natural experiments to try and uh, link uh, volcanic behavior to the characteristics of the subduction zone or to try and set up natural experiments where uh, tectonic setting is, is essentially controlled for so that you can start to understand what, what really controls how a volcano behaves. And I just wanted to end by describing one more, one example in detail from a group of volcanoes that I know really well. Um, these are the Cook Inlet volcanoes. Um, so the easternmost uh, section of the Aleutian Arc um, near Anchorage. This is, includes Mount Spur, recently erupted in 92, Redoubt, um, which has had several eruptions in the past decades, Iliamna, which has not erupted historically, um, and Augustine, which again erupted recently and is currently showing uh, signs of unrest that may culminate in another eruption. Um, so these are definitely volcanoes that have a personality, but I think you can argue that there's something, there's a lot that, that they share that's in common. Um, so the rate of unrest at these volcanoes is very similar. There seems to be a, a sort of 10 to 20 year periodicity to something happening at these volcanoes. They're all closely clustered within 200 kilometers, um, evenly spaced. So probably on some level experiencing uh, very similar tectonic 
uh, and stress and geologic conditions. Um, but there are some interesting differences, and in, in my mind, one of the most interesting is that uh, three of these erupt fairly regularly and one does not, so Iliamna has not erupted. And if you look back into the, uh, his, the geologic record, there's evidence that Iliamna, for some reason, erupts much less than the other three. And this is, of course, a big open question in volcanology, what, what causes a volcano to not erupt. So this Iliamna has in, intrusions on the same rate as the other volcanoes have eruptions. So I think this is a nice place, for example, to set up a hypothesis that either there's something about the composition of Iliamna's magmas that prevents uh, eruption, um, that causes stalling. There's a structural feature um, localized to Iliamna uh, that, again, prevents magma from reaching the surface, only making it into the mid-crust. And these are the types of things that are testable um, through uh, sort of corridor-focused studies, looking at magma compositions along this in this group looking at more detailed um, structural imaging uh, in this group and then trying to essentially use this as a laboratory to address some of the, the major hypotheses for why magmas intrude but fail to erupt. Um, and this is just one example. I think there are many opportunities like this in the Aleutians, but uh, this is just sort of to illustrate this point. Um, so I'll finish there and uh, I think I'm handing off to Rob next. All right. So. Uh... Rob and Michelle, I'm going to pivot over to Michelle's screen. Hey. Hi, everybody. This is Rob Witter with Michelle Coombs in uh, Anchorage. We're with the USGS. And Michelle's charged me with highlighting exciting opportunities and questions in paleo seismology from Alaska. And I'll also touch on Cascadia briefly. Um, <clears throat> as, as Donna mentioned, um, let, let me interrupt just a second. Sorry, Rob. I, I don't see any slides yet. I just want to make sure that these get uh, displayed properly. I think the prompt uh, for you, Michelle, I don't know if you selected show my screen yet. Here we go. How's that? Thanks, Andy. Uh, still waiting. There it is. Got it. All right. Thank you. Sure. So, um, as uh, Donna mentioned, in her overview, nearly the entire Alaska Aleutian subduction zone ruptured in the 20th century. However, before 2010, there were no paleoseismic studies west of Kodiak Island or the western boundary of the great 1964 earthquake. Uh, many basic questions remain about Alaska's subduction earthquake history, including how persistent are rupture boundaries of historic earthquakes, and how do variations in seismicity plate coupling and properties of the subducting slab influence great earthquakes. Research led by the USGS since 2010 has attempted to address these questions at nine sites showed by the colorful skittles in the map. Um, and these span about 1,500 kilometers of the plate boundary to date. Although our findings are beginning to address these questions, many more opportunities exist for future research. So regarding the first question, Findings from a study by Rich Briggs and others at Sitkanak Island, and that's located on the top right in the map. Um, they, they show that the western edge of the great 1964 Alaska earthquake is probably not a persistent rupture boundary. In this photograph, Peter Hoistler examines five sharp lithologic contacts that imply sudden shifts in relative sea level and changes in microfossils across the contacts shown in the diagram over here. They, uh, they, they support interpretations that past earthquakes have produced both uplift and subsidence at this island. So the 1964 rupture, which is depicted in blue here in the diagram on the left, ended at Sitkanak Island, causing subsidence here because the island sits at the lateral edge of the rupture, which is shown in the model on the right. Evidence for uplift during earlier earthquakes implies rupture beneath Sitkanak Island and through the western boundary of the 1964 rupture. Regarding the second question, Donna showed uh, that properties of the subducting slab have clear influence on a subduction zone's behavior. What's less clear is the influence of presently locked and creeping sections of the megathrust on future earthquake potential. Historically, ruptures in 1938, 46, and 57 have broken areas that are presently locked here in dark blue 
and areas that were that are presently creeping in the light blue. But the emerging paleoseismic story is complicated. And so I'll just run through briefly some of our findings. For example, in the Fox Islands, along the western part of the great 1957 earthquake, unusually large tsunamis have frequented a currently creeping part of the Aleutian megathrust in this region right here. But moreover, tsunami simulations by Nikolsky and others, which is just impressed, they agree with geologic observations from a site called Stardust Bay in Orange and the 1957 Dutch Harbor tide gauge, which and, and their simulations suggest shallow slip on the megathrust extended farther east than previously inferred. At Sanak Island, which overlooks part of the megathrust that's presently creeping, um, evidence suggests uh, that in addition to the great 1946 tsunami, past tsunamis occurred prior to 2,000 years ago, but not in 1788 when Russian accounts claim a high tsunami hit Sanak, the Shimigan, and reached as far uh, east as Kodiak Island. In the Shimigan Islands, two field investigations so far show an intriguing absence of evidence for great earthquakes or tsunamis, which leaves open the possibility that persistent creep has relieved strain in this area for thousands of years. And at Chirikov, uh, evidence uh, implies that ruptures of the megathrust probably launched large tsunamis toward the south every 180 to 270 years in the past. So the last opportunity I'll address today uh, touches on paleogeodesy in Cascadia. What's paleogeodesy? It combines the methods of paleoseismology, modeling, and sea level research to reconstruct vertical deformation produced by past earthquakes. In a new paper from a study at Coos Bay, Oregon, which is just north of Cape Blanco in this map, um, by, this is by Yvonne Milker and others, shown in, in the diagram on the left. They use fossil forams and radiocarbon analyses to reconstruct coastal substance during six past earthquakes. The diagram here compares two sharp mud over peak contacts uh, from a place called Talbot Slough and they record different amounts of subsidence. Changes in fossil forams, which are shown in the plots to the directly right, indicate that subsidence in uh, the most recent earthquake in AD 1700 was about 0.3 meters, whereas an earthquake about 2,900 years ago uh, subsided the coast by as much as 0.75 meters. So their results suggest that slip in past Cascadia ruptures has been heterogeneous in time. But what's exciting is how these data can be used to model past ruptures. The figure on the right shows the results of elastic dislocation modeling that simulates heterogeneous slip along strike during the AD 1700 earthquake. And this is a recent paper by Peiling Wang and Kellen Wang. Um, their results show areas of high slip, the warm patches, separated from uh, areas of lower slip that agree with paleogeodetic estimates of subsidence from up and down the, the margin shown in the lower uh, plot. So, uh, so this is an exciting new frontier in, in Cascadia, I think. So just to sum up, um, from Sitkanak Island, we see the western edge of the 1964 Alaska rupture does not appear to be a persistent boundary, but what about other boundaries in, of historic earthquakes? Um, in the, in the Shumigans, it appears that creep on the megathrust may have controlled rupture size uh, for, for several thousand years, but elsewhere, it, it appears that ruptures occur in both areas that are presently creeping and locked. And then finally, in Cascadia, the AD 1700 earthquake exhibited heterogeneous slip, but what about its precedent predecessors? Were they similar or different? And uh, in my presentation, I've also included some re relevant papers for your resource. Thanks. All right. Uh, let me encourage everybody, if you have any questions, to start submitting them. And then I'm going to pivot over to you, Donna, for your uh, final slide. Great. Actually, if, if we want, we can just, I've, I've put our final slide up here uh, that just has a few questions. I think it may be too late. Do you see my screen? Sure do. Okay. All right. 
however we get it done. So I just have here a slide that repeats the, um, the bullets that uh, David uh, put up earlier with some of the questions uh, that we wanted to pose to you, the community, uh, for feedback. Um, you know, I, the pop-up speakers did an excellent job of highlighting some really important um, and interesting science opportunities. Um, so we'd like you know, further feedback on other um, science targets that um, people think are important for any possible SEO activities in Alaska or Cascadia. Um, also ideas on what capabilities, data sets, and infrastructure would be needed, and, um, and other ideas about uh, partners. And we hope that you're busily typing in lots of comments uh, into the webinar um, question box now, but um, if you think of something later that you would like us to represent, please email Michelle, David, um, or myself, and uh, we can include your feedback in the presentation we give to the workshop. So with that, um, let's open it up. So I just have uh, one comment so far, and it was uh, it was from Donna Blackman near the start. Uh, I think when David was reviewing some of the uh, seismic data sets that are available, she just pointed out that Steve Holbrook had a multi-channel seismic survey called Coast that was a, a relevant data set for that. Um, so I have a question here from uh, Derek Schutt, and Derek asks, how well is the metamorphic petrology of subducting crust known and its role in fluid fluxes? I'll go ahead and take a stab at that one. Um, the way most people are modeling slab metamorphic reactions and dehydration uh, <clears throat> now is using the perplex program, uh, and it allows them to couple the uh, computed phase equilibria um, and depths of water release from various mineral breakdown reactions to uh, 2D thermomechanical uh, models as uh, the slab heats up. So that's really become the standard that allows people to compare what's happening in slabs of different ages. But of course that doesn't include any of the details of what fluid flow is really like uh, within a slab, in particular whether there's a substantial component of updip flow uh, of fluids within slabs. Um, and so that's that's one really important issue for the I think the future modeling of slabs to understand the, the actual fluid pathways. Um, uh, and secondly, uh, it doesn't take into account any metastability that might occur uh, within the subducted plate. And then third, there are important issues about um, uh, cooling uh, caused by fluid circulation uh, due to the permeability within the oceanic crust. Um, uh, the type of work that Glenn Spinelli has worked on quite a bit uh, that helps control the temperature uh, distribution within the subducted plate um, in, in a way that's modified uh, from what it would be just based on the plate age. So I have a, a follow-up comment uh, to some of this discussion from Christy Till, uh, who notes, we still really struggle with how deeply the slab is hydrated, i.e. what depth does serpentinization extend to? That is crucial for figuring out H2O flux with perplex, et cetera. Um, and she adds that this is a crucial thing that could be worked on in an SEO. Yeah, I think that's a that's a very important question. Uh, and if you look at the models that have been done both for Cascadia and for arcs around the world, there's a potential for substantial amounts of water in the form of a serpentinized mantle in the subducting oceanic plate to be carried back to depth and, and released at different depths depending on the uh, uh, the temperatures within the subducting oceanic crust. So it's a really big unknown. Uh, in the case of Cascadia, there is the recent work of uh, Shuo Shuo Han with Suzanne Carbot and Pablo Canales, um, where they've used uh, seismic data for the Juan de Fuca plate to uh, place constraints on the distribution and the extent of serpentinization that might happen within that uh, oceanic uppermost mantle. And it seems to limit it uh, to uh, relatively small amounts of serpentinization. Uh, in contrast to that, uh, a lot of the modeling that's been done uh, simulating water being carried into uh, uh, into subduction zones has assumed much more extensive uh, hydrated uh, uh, sections of mantle in the downgoing plate. So I, I, I'm glad Christy raised that point. It's a really, uh, I think, a crucial issue for understanding arc volcanism and water transport back into the mantle. This is Donna Shillington. I just wanted to follow up on that. That's I think that's a great point, and I think that some of the recent studies off of Central America, Alaska, and elsewhere show us that you have big changes in what we 
we think the amount of water stored in the upper mantle um, between subduction zones and even within subduction zones. And, and so that's very important to, to get the rest of it right, to know that, as well as the depth extent. And I think there's only uh, maybe one study I know of that's really been able to even begin to capture that off of Central America. So I have a comment uh, from Jeff McGuire, a uh, comment and a question. Uh, Jeff says, Cascadia is really remarkable for being so seismically quiet despite being mid to late in its seismic cycle. What opportunities do you see that would help most understand that behavior? Sorry, this is David. I had problems unmuting myself. <laughs> um, so I'll, I'll make an attempt at that. Um, so I think one way to get at that is uh, there have been relatively few large-scale models done of Cascadia to look at the distribution of stress um, within the system. Uh, and so that is one possible way to look at uh, Cascadia. There's also the, the, you know, the theories that Cascadia is quiet because it's either locked or creeping, and so trying to assess uh, the extent of aseismic behavior within the subduction zone uh, is another way to address that, particularly offshore. Uh, we also know very little about the offshore seismicity as I, many groups are trying to develop offshore catalogs. So I have a couple, a uh, couple more comments and questions have been streaming in. Uh, one is from Donna Blackman, and uh, Donna comments uh, and asks: uh, Intensive hydration could be rather localized, so that a variable signature may be the rule. And uh, Anna Kelbert adds: uh, Electromagnetic methods in conjunction with geodynamic modeling could help shed light on the water brought into the mantle question. Uh, this is Doug. I guess those are great comments from Donna and, and a great question from Jeff. And uh, I think it's important to get beyond um, 2D transects of, that are sort of regionally spaced throughout these systems. And um, we need to have, I think what's lacking in lots of subduction zones is higher resolution um, information at uh, key locations. And if it is Heterogeneous, like Donna says, then that's something I think through EM and geo other geophysical methods, seismic methods, one can explore the more detailed structure of the physical properties on the thrust zone. With regards to Jeff's earlier question, I also think that in Cascadia, some offshore, offshore geodesy, I, I, I really think there's a significant change in the convergence directions and a style of deformation between southern Cascadia and central Cascadia. And, uh, simply knowing what those are, I think, would be uh, fundamentally useful information. So the uh, next uh, question is from Christy Till, and uh, Christy writes, on another topic, I think a great question we can work on in these types of relatively well-instrumented arcs, what are the relative rates of the processes controlling volcanic hazards, timescales of magma transport, not just in the crust, which Diane nicely highlighted in her discussion of the Cook Inlet, et cetera, but from the mantle to the surface. Uh, this may be key in understanding those personalities and system variables controlling volcanic behavior. This is Diana. I absolutely agree. And I think that there, there are some ongoing efforts along those lines, but certainly that is a major question. Um, that can be addressed both petrologically and, and using instrumentation. Um, and that is a, a major question, both from a fundamental how volcanoes work, but also very important to the hazards perspective. Um, right now, you know, we see eruptions coming on a scale of hours to weeks to maybe months, but um, if we're able to identify how long it takes magma to ascend um, from the very root of the system, that might allow for the possibility of extending those forecasts. So I think that's a, a very nice point. Thank you, Christy. So Seth Moran and Yoshi Ito uh, asked uh, and slash commented basically uh, the same question. Uh, so I'm going to combine those two. 
was basically asking, uh, there hadn't been a lot of discussion yet in these presentations about establishing offshore monitoring, either in Cascadia or Alaska. And they were uh, wondering if you could comment on the potential of uh, what role that activity could or should play in an SEO, both you know, seismic and GPS slash acoustic geodesy. Well, I'll, I'll chime in with a general comment. I think it's critical to have additional observations and sustained observations offshore, uh, seismic and particularly geodetic. Uh, we know very little offshore Cascadia and Alaska, what's happening from a geodetic perspective. Um, and the, the statement I always like to use is we currently really only see half the subduction system, the onshore half. And so if we really want to understand the system, we have to go offshore. I'll just chime in in agreement. This is Donna Shillington. Um, because a lot of our understanding of uh, geodetic locking along these subduction zones comes only from um, onshore stations, it's possible even that in creeping sections of the Alaska subduction zone, for example, in the offshore part, you could still hide locked zones. Um, and a couple of uh, papers by Fournier and Freimuller illustrate that really well. So for a complete picture, I, I think those kinds of offshore studies would be um, really revolutionize our understanding of the subduction zone. So I have a question from Zach uh, Ilan, who asks, uh, how do the early results of the IMUSH project inform the sorts of logistics, uh, parentheses, number slash distribution of sensors for a detailed geophysical look at corridors of volcanoes such as the ones that, Diana, you discussed, i.e., any idea how many uh, would need to be deployed on Iliamna, and uh, do they need to span onshore, offshore locations? Um, of course, something on the order of IMUSH would be fantastic. I'm not sure how realistic that is, especially if you're trying to look at a suite of volcanoes. Um, the nice thing about, again, about the Aleutian volcanoes is that many of them have pretty decent networks to begin with, and so it's, it's more a matter of, like Mount St. Helens, um, supplementing an existing network. Um, but access is difficult, um, so I think that's, that's a question that would have to be looked at, how, what is the minimum resolution you would need. Um, so the project I described, for example, is basically looking for um, a major structural barrier or major um, lithologic changes, um, and that could be done with a, a smaller network than the one on IMUSH, which is really aimed at, at locating um, the features of the volcanic plumbing system as opposed to, um, as I understand it, characterizing the subsurface geology and looking for things that might show up as a, a reflector or um, something that you might be able to identify with um, only a moderate scale network. And just to follow up, um, offshore, onshore, um, uh, I don't know that it would be necessary. Augustine is a small island, um, so network apertures are necessarily small when they're onshore. Um, but again, I think um, you know, it would certainly not be on a major scale, um, and it wouldn't be possible to do that on a major scale if you were trying to look at groups of volcanoes. So the trade-off is um, looking at several volcanoes in a similar way, um, having to spread that instrumentation out and have slightly less dense um, observations to work with. So I have a, a comment from and question from Philip Ruprecht. Um, so Philip observes that the focus of uh, most of the presentations today have uh, been on historic or near historic records of volcanic and earthquake activity, but we mean we may need to extend uh, further into the long term history of the arcs. If we rely only on modern observations, we will have to wait a long time before we can have representative data sets. So how can we merge modern observations with prehistoric records? And then uh, his example would be, uh, for example, magma pathway rates from the mantle to the surface may take in some cases much longer or have nothing to do with the current personality. Other times the connection is direct. Uh, this is Michelle Coombs. I'll, I'll speak to that a little bit. 
certainly I agree with Philip's observation that to really understand a volcanic system or indeed a, a subduction system, you have to look beyond our historical time frame. Uh, to do that is slow and time consuming, and I think that there's much, much more work to be done. Uh, but uh, on the volcanic side, certainly combining high resolution, um, geochronic, geochronologically constrained eruptive histories that go back in time um, with techniques such as diffusion chronometry or, or other techniques that get at time scales uh, of eruptive processes can kind of be used in tandem to paint a picture over a much longer time frame. So there's a lot, lot more to be done on the um, volcanic side. A lot of the work that Rob talked about in his presentation is going back and looking at, at prehistoric records of, of um, subduction zone earthquakes and tsunamis. So um, certainly lots to be done on both those fronts. So I have a, a question from Ida Farrow. Um, so uh, Ida asks, other than modeling and instrumentation studies, are there plans of incorporating or implementing experimental studies to understand subduction zone processes that link geophysical behavior and geochemical reactions, such as serpentinization reactions? Well, maybe I can just briefly speak uh, to that question as one of the organizers of the upcoming workshop in Boise that yes, uh, we do have um, uh, quite a few attendees from the experimental community coming and um, I think that's going to be one of the major um, points is how to uh, bring different communities together um, and, and bridge the, the gap between experimental work and uh, field-based or observational work. Um, uh, maybe somebody can comment on specific opportunities in the Aleutians, but I know that that's, uh, that's something that's well represented at the upcoming workshop. So I have a, a question from Joseph Burns, and he asks, what scale of offshore geodet geodetic experiments can be conducted with the technology that's currently available? Uh, that's a hard one to, to answer. Um, I mean, it, it really comes down to cost controls the scale. Um, I, I think um, if you were just looking at social events and you knew where they occurred, then you could put on a fairly small array. Um, but if you don't know where they are, then you have to look widely or make a good guess. <laughs> so I... Um, yeah, it's kind of hard for me to answer of what scale is needed. Um, th there are various technologies that could be deployed, everything from uh, campaign deployments of instruments um, to putting it on a cable to doing some kind of mesh array where the stations communicate uh, via a radio, not radio, but acoustic waves. Um, so there are various technologies that can get you there. It just depends on cost. Maybe just to uh, link in a question that's uh, the, the next one on my list here is from Yoshi Ito, and it's a follow-up to his original question. Uh, and Yoshi uh, says that probably real-time monitoring is one of the important keys, especially for GPS and acoustic geodesy for bottom pressure uh, and bottom pressure observations. Uh, could you comment any more on the feasibility of a, a real-time monitoring framework? Would it really just go back to cost? Well, I think cost is a limiting factor right at the moment, but new technologies might lower that cost and make it feasible. Um, so, of course, if you have real-time technology, then you can pull in earthquake early warning and do tsunami early warning where you actually are able to say something about the tsunami source. Um, so there, there are opportunities there that could be exploited. So I have a, a comment from Aaron Hirsch that follows up on uh, the original discussion of um, volcanic island seismic coverage, similar to IMUSH. Uh, his suggestion was replacing uh, sensors with additional offshore sources. Uh, this will make up for the poor onshore aperture. So 
certainly that would be great. Um, uh, I, I think that that could could definitely, especially um, for the, the the question that was brought up earlier about understanding the deeper sources. You know, having having a wider aperture um, from OBS um, would allow us a uh, much better look at uh, deep sources. Um, for example, there's there's you know hints of deep seismicity beneath many of these volcanoes that's poorly resolved um, because of the depth, um, because of the attenuation, um, and uh, you know. Cost and logistics aside, um, having OBS networks around some of these island volcanoes um, would be fantastic. Um, again, I think there's a question there as to um, you know, logistically how feasible that is and, and uh, whether the focus would be on a single system or more spread on multiple systems. All right, so currently I have uh, two questions left in the queue. Uh, they're both a little bit uh, more broader uh, topics. So the first one's from Derek Schutt. And uh, Derek writes, speaking as a member of the IRIS Education and Public Outreach Committee, do the various presenters feel like there are things that could be done to broaden the base of researchers or universities slash colleges working on this problem? Uh, so he suggests, you know, potentially webinars on specific tools or topics, et cetera. If so, what would you suggest? I guess the one, Mr. Talk to me, the one comment I would have is I, I think community experiments uh, allow larger cross sections of younger investigators. I think the Cascade Initiative took over 100 early career scientists to see, and many of them are using the data. So um, I, I think you know studying subduction zones requires us to go offshore. It is going to be expensive, and you can have a broader reach of that data into the community by making these efforts, uh, community efforts. This is Donna. I just wanted to follow up and say that I, yeah, I, I fully agree that I think um, one part of the solution are open data sets, but combined with um, focused workshop and training opportunities to um, empower new users to use uh, the new data that are that are coming in now and will hopefully come in from the uh, from the SEO. All right, uh, next question is from Anna Kelbert. Uh, and she asks uh, about the proposed scope and intent of SEO. Would the scope of work include a collaboration with the Cascadia early warning efforts? More generally, do we intend to come up with guidance or recommendations that have direct societal relevance? Or is this work going to be focused on digging into the basic understanding with no recommendations involved? Uh, this is Diana. We actually, um, if uh, for folks who are attending the workshop, that will be one of the uh, major breakout discussions. Um, how do we uh, balance fundamental research uh, aims with um, uh, hazards or, or applied? Um, and uh, both, both what is that balance and, and how is it achievable? Um, so I think that's, that's something we definitely plan to discuss in great detail and consider as we move forward with the SEO concept. I think there are, are opportunities for partnering with Earthquake Early Warning. This topic comes up. It comes up not just amongst the scientific groups, but uh, congressmen and senators from the Pacific Northwest are interested in offshore monitoring. They visited Japan. They uh, know what uh, that country is doing. And so it's, uh, they also understand the cost, and uh, they see that as a longer-term goal. So I, I think it's important that um, it probably be a big topic at the upcoming meeting is uh, you know not to limit ourselves by discussions of cost, but you know what can be done at an SEO over a long period of time, and then how can we? Uh, I think one of the ways we're, we could fund that is certainly by making it more um, applicable to societal needs. All right, I am uh, down to one question left. Uh, so if anybody else has one that they want to get in before we adjourn, uh, please do so now. And uh, this question is from uh, Helen Januszewski. And she asks, uh, given the existing data in both Cascadia and Alaska, are there any questions 
that could be efficiently addressed through collaborative efforts to examine or integrate data sets in novel ways. What questions do you think would require collecting additional data sets? Anna, I think there's huge opportunity for this in, in volcanology. Um, the, there, there's still a lot that can be done with uh, and should be done uh, with catalog data um, from the AVO. Um, I think that there have some been some very successful recent examples of that. I showed uh, Helena Berman's study um, as an example. I think of, of stepping back and starting to examine those data for arc-wide trends. Um, I think there are an equal number of, of studies that can be done um, that require additional instrumentation. Um, as an example, the study that we, uh, that Terry Plank and I are doing currently in the Aleutians is a hybrid um, where uh, we're in part relying on data uh, from existing monitoring networks and in part we, we essentially supplemented the monitoring networks um, to fill in uh, our quarter, the, the coverage, to obtain the coverage of our quarter volcanoes that uh, wasn't cur currently represented by the existing network. Um, so I don't know that it's necessarily an either, either or, um, but uh, I think both with the existing uh, instruments that are bringing in real-time data and also supplementing those and also looking at the historic data, uh, certainly from the volcano side, there's a lot that can be done there. Well, I'm officially out of questions on this end. Uh, I don't know if anybody else wants to comment or if, Donna, you wanted to have any concluding remarks before we uh, adjourn. All right. I just wanted to say thank you to everyone who's uh, participated in the webinar and, uh, and provided all of your questions and comments um, through the webinar. Uh, please don't hesitate to get in touch with Michelle, David, or I with other ideas, thoughts, opinions. <laughs> um, uh, after the webinar as you have them. And I also just wanted to thank all of our um, speakers and panelists for um, all the exciting science ideas. So we'll try and do our best to represent a lot of the um, ideas that have been raised in this webinar and the SCO workshop in a couple weeks. So thank you to everyone. Yeah, thanks everybody and uh, good job speakers. Uh, no technical glitches, which I'm really excited about. So uh, anyway, I'm going to uh, end the webinar here and uh, this will be available on YouTube in probably an hour or two. And uh, just as a reminder, there's three more webinars this week. Information is on the SEO website and we'll see some of you in Boise.